This is the final lecture in a five-lecture series on the land battles of Guadalcanal. This lecture will focus on the last attempt by the Imperial Japanese Navy to reinforce the beleaguered Japanese garrison on Guadalcanal for a fourth attempt to retake Henderson Field and the subsequent Japanese evacuation in February 1943. I will conclude this lecture with a summary of the losses to each side and a description of the strategic situation in the Southwest Pacific Theater following the American victory at Guadalcanal. I would first like to summarize the three Japanese attempts to retake Henderson Field. The August attempt was the Battle of the Teneru, which resulted in the annihilation of the Ichiki Detachment, nearly an entire battalion. The September attempt was the Battle of Bloody Ridge, and it too failed. The October attempt was the Battle of Henderson Field, and it also failed. The Japanese Army planned another attack for November to try yet again to retake Henderson Field. For this they would need additional reinforcements. They asked the Navy for help. Admiral Yamamoto provided 11 large transport ships to carry 10,000 Army troops from the 38th Infantry Division, their ammunition, food, and heavy equipment from Rabaul to Guadalcanal. This convoy would be under the cover of a major Japanese naval bombardment of Henderson Field under the command of Admiral Mikawa. This would be the disastrous naval battle of Guadalcanal of November 12th through the 15th. On the afternoon of November 13th, Admiral Mikawa departed the Shortland Islands just southeast of Bougainville for the high-speed run to Guadalcanal with 11 transports escorted by 11 destroyers. Early the next day, aircraft from Enterprise struck first. This was followed by attacks from planes based at Henderson and Espiritu Santo. These attacks first hit Mikawa's bombardment force and then Tanaka's transports heading toward Guadalcanal down the slot. The aerial attacks on Mikawa's force sank Kinugasa Maru, killing 511 of her crew and damaged the Maya Maru. Repeated attacks on the transports overwhelmed the Japanese fighter escorts and sank six of the transports and forced a seventh to turn back with heavy damage. The seventh transport later sank. 450 Japanese troops were reported killed in the attacks. The survivors were picked up by the escorting destroyers and returned to the Shortlands. The remaining four transports and nine destroyer escorts still afloat continued to Guadalcanal after nightfall of November 14th. With time running out for Tanaka to get his men and supplies ashore, he decided to run the transports aground on the beach. Three beached themselves at the same time, and by 0500 on November 15th, the fourth had also beached. Of the destroyers, only one landed any men. The transports immediately disgorged their troops and piled supplies on the shore nearby. As soon as the transports had emptied, Tanaka rounded up his destroyers and steamed past Savo toward the northwest. By 0600 that morning, Marine fighters and SPD dive bombers found the beach transports and attacked them, scoring hits on two of them. Throughout the day, five more attacks were made on the Japanese ships, leaving them burning. An SPD dropped a bomb on an ammunition dump, resulting in a titanic explosion which could be felt several miles away at the Lunga perimeter. A column of smoke reached a height of 2,000 feet. The fire burned all night and was still burning 16 hours later. What did Tanaka accomplish with this convoy at the cost of all 11 of his transports? Of the 10,000 troops he set out with, only 2,000 successfully landed from the beach transports and the lone destroyer, along with 260 boxes of shells and some 1,500 bags of rice, only four days' rations for the destitute 17th Army. This was almost negligible given their desperate situation. Despite the disastrous results of the naval battle of Guadalcanal and Tanaka's doomed convoy, 
Japanese strength on Guadalcanal was brought up to 30,000 by mid-November. It was obviously clear that the Japanese Navy, having strained its capabilities to put so many troops ashore, had no practical way of feeding so many mouths. By the first week of December, they were succumbing en masse to plague and famine. To the Japanese, Guadalcanal had become Starvation Island. Many had thrown away their rifles because they either felt too weak to carry them or they had run out of ammunition. Trails into the hills were littered with the bodies of dead and dying men. Those immobilized by malaria, dinghy fever, or beriberi were often abandoned to die where they lay. Japanese combat deaths were running at 40 to 50 per day mainly as a result of air attacks, but some three times that number were succumbing to disease or starvation. A new supply tactic was urgently needed. Tanaka came up with the drum method. Using high-speed destroyers, he made nightly runs down the slot and dropped off hundreds of steel drums filled with food and other supplies. On December 3rd, ten destroyers dropped 1,500 supply drums off Cape Esperance. Unfortunately for the starving Japanese, only about 300 reached them. Tanaka made another run on December 7th but his ships were harried by bombers and fighters, then attacked and driven off by six PT boats west of Savo Island. On December 11th, he made one more run when he sortied with nine destroyers and managed to drop 1,200 supply drums. The Japanese had to swim out to fetch the drums. The next morning, American fighters flying from Henderson strafed and destroyed several hundred drums found drifting in Iron Bottom Sound. That same evening, American PT boats swarmed out of Tulagi Harbor and launched torpedoes, one of which struck Tanaka's flagship. Tanaka was wounded in the attack. While recovering in a hospital at Bunin, Tanaka was disgusted to learn that only 220 of the 1,200 drums launched that night had been recovered. His ship detonated at 0400 the next day when fires reached the powder magazine and she began to sink. While convalescing at Buin, he also learned that Admiral Yamamoto had finally decided that the cost of resupply missions was too great and had to be suspended. Yamamoto ordered Tanaka to begin taking supplies not to Guadalcanal, but to New Georgia to build a base at Munda, whose position had become newly important in the failure of the Japanese 17th Army to mount the expected offensive at New Guinea and to retake Guadalcanal. Here is a map indicating where Munda is located on the southwest coast of New Georgia. This would be the main Japanese airfield after they abandoned Guadalcanal and the next target for the Allies. The Imperial Japanese Army and Navy never really got along, often hiding from each other their own military disasters. They would each blame the other for the loss of Guadalcanal. Eventually, with the intervention of Emperor Hirohito, they decided to abandon Guadalcanal and to try to evacuate the remaining Japanese army still there before they starved to death. Thus was put into place Operation Key, the secret evacuation of the remnants of the Japanese 17th Army starving and dying on Guadalcanal. On December 9th, General Vandegrift and the exhausted 1st Marine Division was relieved and sent to Melbourne, Australia for R&R. They were replaced by Major General Alexander Patch of the 14th Corps, composed of the 25th Infantry Division and the 2nd Marine Division. General Patch would have the task of mopping up Guadalcanal. This was the tactical situation on Guadalcanal in January 1943. The Gifu had been invested by the 35th Infantry, and the perimeter had been pushed beyond the western side of the Matanikau. The Japanese no longer threatened Henderson Field. As the Japanese grew weaker and weaker, the Americans grew stronger and stronger. The Japanese ceased all offensive action in the Lower Solomons. 
General Patch was unaware of the Japanese intention to evacuate. Radio traffic analysis misled American intelligence to believe that the Japanese were mounting another naval offensive and troop landing, and the American commanders reacted accordingly. His plan was to clear the Japanese out of Guadalcanal altogether by advancing on a broad front from Point Cruz to Kokombona. By January 22nd, the Gifu Redoubt had been destroyed. At this point, there was no threat to the American left flank. On January 14th, 600 fresh Japanese infantry and an artillery battalion called the Yano Battalion was transported to Guadalcanal by nine destroyers. This was to be the rear guard to cover the evacuation scheduled for early February. On January 22nd, the Composite Army and Marine Division advanced from Point Cruz toward Cocombona. The 6th Marines advanced along the beach while two Army regiments, the 147th and the 182nd, advanced inland over the grassy hills. This advance was preceded by an artillery barrage. Cocombona was captured the following day. By the first week of February 1943, the American forces in the South Pacific expected the Japanese to make another full-scale attempt to retake Guadalcanal. Allied intelligence agencies had erred in their estimate of Japanese intentions. The Japanese continued their withdrawal northwest toward Cape Esperance. General Patch's plan was to prepare to resist Japanese attempts to land reinforcements by deploying a large part of his corps northwest of Kokombona and also to continue to pursue the retreating 17th Army to Cape Esperance. Between January 10th and January 31st, Marine and soldiers of the 14th Corps had driven the Japanese back at the cost of 189 KIA and 400 wounded. 105 Japanese had been taken prisoner and 4,000 were estimated to have been killed. The Corps also captured a large number of Japanese weapons and ammunition. During the night of February 1st and 2nd, the Japanese began the first of three evacuation runs. That same night, a battalion of the 132nd Infantry landed on the northwest side of Guadalcanal and began an overland march toward Cape Esperance. On February 7th, the battalion had reached here. By then, the Japanese had made two more evacuation runs and had completely quitted Guadalcanal, which was still unknown to the advancing Americans. On February 8th, the 161st Infantry encountered some Japanese at the Tambalego River, but after a brief firefight drove the Japanese off and continued the advance. The battalion of the 132nd moved closer to Cape Esperance, anticipating meeting the Japanese who were, by now, already gone. The first evacuation run was completed on the night of February 1st and 2nd. 21 Japanese destroyers lifted 4,935 soldiers from the island, nearly half of those remaining. On the night of February 4th and 5th, the Japanese returned with 20 destroyers. Fighting off air and PT boat attacks, they embarked 3,921 soldiers and returned them safely to Bougainville the next day. The third and final run, on the night of February 7th and 8th, lifted 1,796 men from Guadalcanal. Thus ended the Japanese Dunkirk. The bodies of 16,800 Japanese soldiers were left behind on Guadalcanal, many unburied. Many are still there yet today. By February 9th, the two advancing forces of the Pincer Movement met just east of Cape Esperance. The Japanese had by now already evacuated over 10,000 skeletal soldiers and had officially abandoned Guadalcanal. Organized resistance on Guadalcanal was over. General Patch sent the following message to Admiral Halsey. Total and complete defeat of Japanese forces on Guadalcanal effected 1625 today. I'm happy to report this kind of compliance with your orders because the Tokyo Express no longer has a terminus on Guadalcanal. 
During the six-month Battle of Guadalcanal, the two sides suffered roughly equivalent naval and air losses. Sixty-seven ships had been sunk in the contest over the island to hold or recapture Henderson Field. The U.S. Navy lost 29 ships, and the Imperial Japanese Navy lost 38. The Japanese sank two valuable carriers, the Wasp and the Hornet, and damaged the Enterprise, the only carrier left to the U.S. Navy in the Pacific at the time. But the U.S. Navy sank one Japanese light carrier and damaged another, and sank two battleships. Both sides lost many cruisers, destroyers, and non-combatant transport and cargo ships that could not be easily replaced. On several occasions, beginning with the Battle of Savo Island, the Japanese Navy had given proof of its excellence in night surface combat. Their lookouts had exceptionally good eyesight, and they had good optical glasses. They also had the best torpedo of any navy at the time, the Long Lance. The early Japanese advantage in nighttime surface combat was soon eclipsed by the U.S. Navy's adroit use of radar for range finding and fire control. By the fall of 1942, an American ship could land its first salvo on an unseen Japanese ship without the benefit of searchlights or flares. This was a valuable technical advantage over the Japanese, and it largely offset the superior skill, training, and torpedo weaponry of the Japanese surface fleet. Each side lost between 600 and 700 aircraft, but the fraction of downed pilots and aircrew who recovered told a different story. The Allies lost about 420 pilots and aircrew in the Solomons, the Japanese more than three times that number. Since the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942, Japanese aircrew losses consistently exceeded those of the Allies, often by a wide margin. Replacement pilots coming out of Japan's wartime training pipeline lacked the skill or confidence to carry on the air war effectively. Japan was losing its best pilots at an unsustainable pace. They would pay for this shortcoming in the coming months, especially in the Central Pacific campaigns. Most striking was the disproportion in troops lost. The U.S. Army and Marine Corps suffered 5,875 casualties, of whom 1,592 were KIA. The Japanese Army lost two full divisions on the island, the majority of whom were killed rather than wounded and evacuated, 14,700 KIA or MIA, and an estimated 9,000 died of disease or starvation. These figures do not include the losses at sea during the seven naval battles fought around Guadalcanal. Losses to the U.S. and Australian Navy exceeded more than 5,000, far more than the losses on the ground defending Henderson Field. The Japanese losses were probably in excess of 4,000. General Kawaguchi, commanding officer in the two failed attempts to retake Henderson Field, said of Guadalcanal after the war, Guadalcanal is the name of the graveyard of the Japanese army. After the war, several Japanese officers offered their unvarnished critiques of the war. Captain Hara judged that the Japanese Navy really lost the war as a result of a series of strategic and tactical blunders by Admiral Yamamoto after Midway. In Hara's opinion, Yamamoto had failed to commit the bulk of his naval power immediately after the Marines' invasion and had instead flung into the area one small fleet unit after another. Running concurrently with the fighting on Guadalcanal, the Imperial Japanese Army was also heavily engaged in a desperate fight in New Guinea to take Port Moresby by an overland route across the Owen Stanley Mountains. They were committed to both operations, New Guinea and Guadalcanal, at the same time. The 1st Marine Division's successful defense of Henderson Field against Japan's 17th Army reduced the number of Japanese troops available for the campaign in New Guinea the Japanese had made the fatal mistake of dividing their forces. The Japanese clearly realized that the Solomons and New Guinea campaigns were integral parts of one whole. Attempting to reinforce Guadalcanal at the expense of New Guinea 
the Japanese lost both. Admiral Kondo, commander of the Imperial Navy's second fleet, agreed with Hara that Yamamoto should have thrown everything he had at Guadalcanal in August, even if it required abandoning the offensive in New Guinea. He quoted a Japanese proverb, He who pursues two hares catches neither. This was the strategic situation in the southwest Pacific after the Battle of Guadalcanal. The Americans controlled the seas and had air superiority around the lower Solomons. The Australians had pushed the Japanese back from Port Moresby to the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula where they and the American army would eventually defeat them at Buna. With the victory at Guadalcanal, the Allies had won a well-situated base from which to continue the offensive against Rabaul, the ultimate target of Operation Cartwheel. The Allied offensive into the Solomons had halted the Japanese advance toward the U.S.-Australian line of communication and had taken the strategic initiative from the hitherto victorious Japanese, never to relinquish it. From the newly acquired base at Guadalcanal, Admiral Halsey would next set his sights on the first part of Task 2 of Operation Cartwheel, the capture of the Japanese air base at Munda on the island of New Georgia, Operation Toenails, scheduled for June 1943. Running concurrently with Operation Toenails on New Georgia, General MacArthur would capture the islands of Carowina and Woodlark, Operation Chronicle, as part of the Southwest Pacific's responsibility of Task 2 of Cartwheel. Japan's fate was sealed at Guadalcanal. Japan would be on the defensive for the rest of the war. Thank you for listening to this five-part series on the land battles of Guadalcanal. I hope you will be motivated to continue the study of the Pacific War from my other lectures, which will soon be posted. I hope to see you on Cactus someday on one of my tours of this fascinating battlefield. For more information on my Guadalcanal tour and other tours of the world's battlefields, visit www.valortours.com or call 1-800-842-4504.